keputusan pilihan raya yang bagi kuasa di Putrajaya kepada Najib sedangkan 51% rakyat We had an expectation that the elections might be cleaner, you know, this time, but we, our hopes were dashed. We saw immense fraud, cheating, all forms of manipulation, making the elections totally unacceptable. They don't feel that the will of the people has been translated um, uh, into the result in these elections. Uh, complaints were sent to the EC and nobody was listening to them. Um, police reports were made, no investigations were done. There was a deadlock, there was no movement. You know, the door was being closed. There was this proposal to have a people's tribunal. We indeed need to set up a people's tribunal because we, most of us have lost faith in the institutions that are supposed to safeguard the, the, the elections to be free and fair. All it means is, instead of going through the formal process of courts, the people set up the tribunal and express their views. It's an important avenue in situations where you cannot get a remedy anywhere else. We wanted a balance of foreign panel and local panel, uh, people who were involved in human rights work, people who were involved with electoral reforms, who had knowledge and expertise. And I think we're very pleased now with the panel that we have. So our task is to, um, uh, to receive evidence from uh, individuals, groups, uh, about the way the election was conducted. First, well, first we need to investigate whether many of the allegations are made have got any basis at all, that we need to know whether those allegations are credible. The people are coming together uh, to uh, address some of the uh, uh, issues that have been affecting them for a long, long time. Hubungan ASEAN tidak hanya antara G to G, government to government, tapi juga antara rakyat. Nah, kalau ASEAN community itu, maka antara rakyat harus ada saling uh, care, ya, saling saling percaya, saling saling memperhatikan, saling membantu, termasuk saling mengingatkan gitu. They all should come, whether is the winner or the loser, uh, the authorities to explain. So there was a lot of preparation involved in trying to gather the lawyers to help us with the documentation, the affidavits, gathering of evidence. Professor Grudial had kindly agreed to be the lead uh, counsel for this matter. There's a lot of talk about the uh, fraud, illegalities, and so on. Let's verify all these allegations in a properly constituted tribunal, whether anything really went wrong or not, based on concrete evidence. At the end of the day, our best advocate is the truth. All rise. The People's Tribunal is now in session. And so we will be both investigating uh, the, the conduct of the uh, last elections, as well as considering recommendations for reform of the electoral system. Given the time constraints, we will be presenting a sampling of evidence in, re in respect of three broad typologies. Manipulation of the legislative framework underpinning elections, in other words, the laws that exist that could or could not prejudice free and fair elections. Then we, the second is the manipulation of voter choice made by the choice made by individuals to what extent it could be it could or may have been subverted and the manipulation of the administrative process the process by which the elections were carried out in this context we have invited 
all potential parties or organizations referred to in these proceedings to attend from across the political divide. Ms. Inongkiran, do you swear to state the truth in your testimony? Yes, thank you. One week before the, the election, my friends, uh, they were all discussing about uh, their names being counted in the electoral roll on, on, online. Uh, they had never registered before and they found that their name was on the electoral roll. Uh, so I decided to look up for myself. <coughs> My name was there too. The six critical issues that we have identified uh, consists of the Sabah Royal Commission of Inquiry findings, where, where we call them RCI voters. Um, voters issues, uh, uh, electoral issues related to addresses. Um, voters who are non-Malaysians essentially are from Indonesia, Philippines, Pakistan and Bangladeshis. Voters with the same name and same date of birth, last minute and unusual additions to the electoral roll, and questionable movements of voters. And after numerous reports of Malaysian ICs has been widely issued in Sabah, and uh, Merab has coined a special terminology called RCI voters, uh, which refers to the voters who are found in the electoral roll uh, with questionable ICs. This person do not look out of place in Karachi or Kandahar, and then according to his Malaysian um, new identity card, he's actually uh, born in Sabah. So we looked at this IC and we actually found them to be in our 60,000 sample. Okay, our team has done an address completeness analysis. This is the big picture, whereby out of the 13 million voters in Malaysia for G13, we found that almost 30% of these voters, they have very... Um, suspicious or very incomplete incom address information in the electoral roll. All the, uh, as I, I understand it, the uh, discrepancies, the anomalies and all that. Yes. And then reduce it to numbers, you know, 13 million total voters, 30% of that questionable. I think that was uh, yeah. a telling... It's the tip of the iceberg. Uh, of yeah. course, it's still okay. the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. What is the number of electors who were transferred out for no apparent reason? 2,195. One of the things that we found from our analysis uh, was that this very famous house, uh, 994 Jalan Papan Panoran, which had 60 voters at, uh, in the same location. Same when uh, our, our lawyers made the case, and subsequently when the court decided, I think it was a five-page uh, decision. It's the last page said that the courts have no local standi to make a decision because of uh, Rule 9A, uh, which does not allow the courts to oversee the electoral role once it's gazetted by the Elections Commission. And he says Section 9A precludes the courts from looking into the electoral role, never mind whether it's flawed or not. Even if you show it's flawed, they cannot look into it. They can't look into it. That's it. NBN is the absolute beneficiary of Mahaparshaman. First, the top part of the, of the slide show all the constituency sorted by the electorate size. The one in red were those worn by Pakatan Rakyat. Those in blue worn by Barisan National. And every size for a seat worn by Pakatan Rakyat had... 79,000 voters. That's about nearly 60% larger than every seat won by Pakatan Raya, which only about 47,000. In, in Malaysia, it's just the unequal representation is a it's exception a norm. or it's a norm. It's a norm here, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's a norm that unchallenged because I think partly the electoral system, as my, my larger argument, uh, this was to preserve the one-party state established after 1969. So until we are challenging that, uh, this would not happen. That gives the context on all those uh, election, electoral manipulation and fraud that's happening because it's actually systematic. 
If Mao apportionment is about manipulation by creating disparity in electorate size, gerrymandering is manipulation by altering the electorate composition. If you have two constituency with the same types of demography, you can change the outcome by changing the boundary. But you have more interesting things that I cannot find an academic term to describe it. After the constituency redenation in 2003, Mr. Ong stayed put at Subgama, it's now P140, and the state seats NO2 Germanta, while his wife, Mrs. Ong, and the, and the remainings of the families have now moved to P141 Skijang, and O3 Permanis. Now, if we were to believe that the EC has done a fantastic job, we must conclude that the constituency boundary cut across that house. And not only that house, it cut across that room. And not only that room, it must cut across that bed. And they have that private information that Mr. Ong sleep on the side of Skamat while his wife sleep on the side of Skijang. So after 2003 delineation exercise, there's actually a new parliament constituency being created and it's called P141 Sekijang. Now I suddenly from voting in Sagamat, I have since 2004 voting in Sekijang. This is actually what uh, Dr. Wong has actually testified earlier about one bed, two constituencies. <laughs> so I always pity my <laughs> brother and sister-in-law Come polling day, they cannot you know, hold hand and go to the polling, the same polling station to cast their vote. How it had happened. It's not just happened to our household. When we look at this, there are so many uh, households being treated that way. After looking at the registered addresses of the 3,008 voters of Kampong Abdullah, there are groups, okay, when it's a, one group, is basically is one single household. There are so many groups which have both Blue and red. Traditionally, this community has been very pro-opposition. And you look at Sekijang, is BN having 80% of the votes there when it was first created. We can quite safely conclude that Sekijang has been created as a very strong uh, 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 incumbent government seat. And I would also like to speculate that it is a place to dilute any kind of opposition votes that has been transferred there. Dia berkempen, masa itu dia naik helikopter, turun itu di sekolah lah, di sekolah kampung. Dia berjanji, dia cakap, kalau awak orang sokong BN, awak tidak pangkah pembangkang ataupun DAP, saya akan buat jalan, akan bantu kamu buat rumah, apa, apa bantuan kita akan bagi. Sudah tiga kali saya mengundi dan di tempat kami macam itu juga. Dalam pergantian Cik Norman kata, saya telah dibayar RM20 dengan janji tambahan RM80 untuk setiap pengundi jika kami mengundi untuk PM. Betul tak? Uh, ya, yang RM20 kami dibagi tapi sebenarnya yang separuh tak dapat yang datang saja dapat tu yang lapan puluh ringgit tu tak ditepati lah. Now you are opposed in this election by Datuk Raja Nongci. You say he had control and oversight of uh, DBKL, which is a Kuala Lumpur City Council. Yes, it makes the whole battle an uphill one. First, I have to state that members of Parliament from the opposition are denied the constituency allocation fund. So about one to two million ringgit a year is channeled directly to your political nemesis, meaning the ruling coalition representative in that seat, even though you won. So, and you are saying that, you know, you are given uh, a different kind of treatment when you tried to do the same, put up posters, your campaign. I'm lucky if my banners can last two hours. 
I'm not exaggerating. There was a clear bias manner in the way uh, the GE13 was covered in the, uh, and that the opposition was almost always portrayed in a negative light. That the environment, the wider environment, uh, is what constrains many of these journalists. That leads to self-censorship, the, the, the legal requirements that are there, the Printing Presses and Publications Act, an odious act that ought to be totally removed, yeah? The multimedia, uh, the, the, the Communications and Multimedia Act, right? Both of which actually does not allow journalists the freedom. So apart from the acts, that, that's the state, yeah? The state coming in, how the political parties have gone into business or have business have joined up with political parties, right? And subsequently, we get a situation in Malaysia where not only do you have those legalistic controls, but you also have these economic controls coming in. Again, I've stated this many times before, is related to one, ownership, two, control, three, socialization. There's been a murder. Now, Murugan is your security officer. Yeah. On 5th of May, Murugan's floating body was found in a pond near Batu Gaja. Yes. Tell us what Murugan told you. He received a threaten call. He said they threatened to kill him, uh, to chop him in Parang, uh, and shot him. Did he tell you why they wanted to kill or shoot him? Yeah. Um, Murugan also told me that, sir, the threaten call, the threatening call actually want to stop him from campaigning for Pati Kaaderan Rayat and me. Murugan is your son. Murugan, I'm going to take a look. Yes. Ya pelik orang ni di bawah orang. Adik kita ni pelik orang mati. Ni tu mati itu orang. Ni na aji, ni tu na. Ponnya macam teri. Polis karung guru orang. Solo orang lembur. She want justice for the death of her son. Until now, there is no police action taken or whatever it is. What happened to me as a mother should not happen to any mothers. They were waiting in the queue. Waiting in the queue. Yes, to vote. Yeah. Yes. And then what happened? And uh, suddenly the uh, polling center was closed abruptly. What time was that? Uh, around 11 o'clock. Yeah. Was there any notice posted in these two kampongs, Long Item and Long Lilim, no, telling no. the voters that they are going to close at 11? No notice posted. And Mr. Muhammad Fadli is here? Yes, perhaps we can call another witness then. Hari Pembian, Bumumi. Saya dalam pukul 10 lebih, saya pergi mengundi di sekolah sebelah sah. Balik daripada mengundi kali pertama, saya bawa balik rumah, makan, ngari. Dan saya basuh tangan saya, saya dapati uh, dawat kekal uh, hilang. I went back home. Yeah. I had my lunch, I wash my hand. The ink is well done. Dalam pukul 1 lebih, saya pergi ke pusat mengundi yang sama. Ini ke prosedur yang sama, bilik yang sama. Dan saya cuba mengundi kali kedua dan saya berjaya. Tapi saya tidak uh, letakkan kertas mengundi itu dalam ballot box. Why did you go back for a second time? Um, I did this to test whether the Indian bank ink is working or not. So semua orang boleh cakap dah buat tu tak kekal. Okay, dah buat tu. Uh, itu bukti yang mengundi dua kali adalah mustahil. You went to test the system as yes. Okay, uh, you young people do all kinds of things, huh? Because I... I don't trust with the system. And I ask myself myself, if I can do it, how many people can do it? Many people can do it. So this is the advanced voting Vote. ballot boxes. Yes. So people voted, and then the boxes are transported, as we heard yesterday, to the police lockup. Yes. Yes. You say here they saw the Ketua Balai Police 
Ketua Balai opening the lockup area. They enter the lockup. Yes. And then they moved out the ballot box from the police custody, and then they located in the lorry, which is uh, in outside the compound. The information I received is that one day prior to polling, the cells will be open, and EC will will uh, open the cell to take out the ballot papers. Because the tip that I the tip of that I receive is that they're going to exchange the ballot boxes. They're going to duplicate exactly the ballot papers with the serial numbers. I waited for EC to arrive when the car arrived, and I say I insisted on escorting the EC officers to into the cell. They they stopped me at the door with a rifle, with an officer with a rifle. I don't remember how many officers there were, but I remember rifles. This is this this is contrary to what is promised to us. I mean, the, there is a security breach on the ballot boxes for advanced voting. If it happens in my constituency, it can happen to all the other constituencies where advanced voters uh, took advanced voting took place. And if there's a considerable number of advanced voters, it will make a difference. So theoretically, it was possible for someone who had already voted in the advanced voter and vote again, and vote again, yes. theoretically. I mean, I have a, a voter, uh, a, a voters who is the uh, election commission's workers on that day. She is a teacher. She received a, a advance vote paper. She decided not to send it back because not not trusting the system itself. So she just kept the piece of paper. On the day of voting, after her duty, she finished at 2 o'clock, she went into the voting station and she voted. And who are advanced voters? Uh, in this case, the advanced voters were military personnel and police personnel. 240,000 EC workers and 50,000 media personnel were given the right to do postal voting. In fact, if you combine the early and postal voters, it's something like 371,000. The um, outcome of the postal voting process would determine the winner or loser in as many of those places, partly because it was a very contested election in these places. So it was a contested election. So this kind of advanced voting, for example, uh, could make the difference between the winner or loser in about 30 parliamentary seats. About. And our issue is, it is the EC who should be investigating this. And all through, our issue has been that the EC just does not investigate all the incidents uh, of illegality, of electoral violence, of electoral offenses. They just do nothing. <coughs> that's our issue with the EC. And that's why I produce this. I think that we also not have to look at the attitude of the existing election commission, but look at what has happened over time, historically how the election commission has grown and some of its powers have been reduced, uh, in, in fact, over time. Yes, yes. As a result, it decided to play a very narrow role and it dismisses uh, a lot of things as being outside its purview. And really, I think that it is difficult for them to do that because they simply do not know. Uh, to me, they know exactly what they're doing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, they, because the election commission has one job. They don't have to run the country. They're not running the finance ministry. They only do elections. If they haven't got it right by now, then I, I'm not sure that it is just uh, a lack of empowerment. I don't see as being, you know, contrary to what I'm saying. What I feel is that our role is not here to bash the EC. Our role is to look at how to improve the system. And one of the ways to improve the system is perhaps to look at the structure, the institutional structure of the EC, and how and why why is it been so difficult? I, I I tend to feel that some of the difficulties are because their their hands are tied legally. The EC is supposed to be an independent entity as a statutory board under Articles 113 and 114 of the Federal Constitution. As it stands, 
So Sinmo is a department under the Prime Minister's office, both in function and operations. Can you identify whether the Election Commission of Malaysia is identified as being in the Prime Minister's department? Right. Under yes. the Election Commission of Malaysia. Yes. Election Commission members are all ex senior civil servants. So they are thinking they, is there, they are there to serve the government of the day. Two of the senior members of the Election Commission are members of a political party. So the question is can senior members of political parties? public conclusion. Okay. The broader conclusion is also that there was institutional failure on the part of the election commission. Um, that uh, not just the election commission itself, but also uh, inst uh, institutions such as the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, that officers or officials who are either unaware of the laws or they knew the laws but decided not to enforce them. Uh, we have presented evidence of 51 witnesses and presented 71 statutory declarations by the people of Malaysia. Whether at the end of the day, after our summation, there is sufficient to suggest, first, that there were allegations have been adequately made out based on the evidence presented, and secondly, to examine whether these are systemic and germane to the entire electoral process, or were they just some maladministration that occurred along the way. We have invited all players in a fair, even-handed way. We invited the EC, we invited the police, we have invited the BN petitioners, we have invited the uh, BN uh, uh, Secretary General, everybody that has a role to play in shaping the future of this country in the process, in the context of electoral elections and democracy. People's tribunal do not have the force of law, but it is people who shape history, people who can shape governments, people which are the motive force, as we have seen in the making of world history. And of course, you may fail, but as one great Chinese philosopher once said, you fail, then you try. You fail, you try. You fail, you try again until you succeed. This is the logic of the people. Thank you. It will be a tribunal of conscience mandated with the moral force by the people to arrive at the truth. And indeed, that is, I think, the strong point of a a tribunal like this, that uh, it uh, is set up by the people, it responds to the people, and it is indeed a manifestation of the sovereignty of the people. Uh, and we are accountable to the people. 